Hello. Um, is your, are your brains tapped? Pretty full? Yeah, I would imagine. Uh, so whoever's after me, I will be taking about 20 minutes. So we're running probably 10 minutes late. So you've got some time. Um, so let me tell you a quick story about this. This is a paper that we just submitted um, that I have to say, quite honestly, I have never got so much push pushback from reviewers. And, and you'll see why in a second. But there's also a reason here that, um, that I'm presenting this data. So just FYI, I am not an employee of Charlotte's Web. I'm going to talk about Charlotte's Web products. But essentially what we did is a surveillance of their products. I have to commend Charlotte's Web for actually doing the right thing and really getting involved with trying to create more of a safety database. So here's where we're going to go today. We're going to start with what I call the problem. We'll go to the methods we use to help add to data to solve the problem. Um, we'll talk about the data. We'll talk about the AEs, the actual adverse events. And then we will go into these uh, serious adverse events. And then finally, we'll talk about the limitations of everything we've done here. OK, so safety data, right? So we, we've got some clinical trials. Um, that's great. But clinical trials can often be a group of people that don't necessarily represent the population. So we've got a, we've, we need more safety data, my feeling in general, for, for all cannabinoids. And this, could, this method that I'm going to talk about could apply to all cannabinoids. Um, and there's also a huge barrier for research. Uh, um, CBD's relaxed a little bit, but because of Schedule 1, there's so many. I mean, I remember what, what I had to do to just get a, a, a CB1 antagonist when I was doing laboratory work. It was uh, a, bit, a bit onerous. Um, so again, Charlotte's Web has made this data available. And essentially, I took the data and did what I could with it. OK, so let's talk about methods we used. So first, and this may seem like a simple method, but it's actually uh, per uh, FDA regulation. There's a phone number on the, these, um, oh, I thought I had an animation there. Anyway, there's a phone number uh, here at the bottom of this label that points out where you can get a hold of somebody if you're having some sort of an issue with the product. That's a really important piece. And that's often something that's not done in the cannabis industry, unfortunately. Um, so if you want to call and put it, uh, talk about an adverse event, you've got that option. Now, we put together a database. And the database, uh, we followed industry standards based on uh, the CPC, CPSC, uh, the EPA, and the FDA. Um, unfortunately, what this database doesn't include is, is it includes some patient demographics, but not a lot of it. And it's not designed to collect the specific reason why the consumer used the product, although sometimes uh, Charlotte's Web and their system was able to pick up that reason. OK, so Safety Call is a uh, group out of, I think they're in Jersey. Uh, they're somewhere on the East Coast. And they have set up a really excellent surveillance program for all of industry. So whether you're using bug spray, or you're using uh, CBD products, or you're using a dietary supplement, Safety Call has got a service that allows you to track any sort of adverse events. And this is the scheme they use. And I'll go through each step of this, phase one, phase two, and phase three. So phase one, let's talk about that. So in intake and documentation. Um, so you get a, a narrative of the product use and reported adverse effects on this. Um, and you're looking for accurate identification of product or active ingredients. And I have to say that you look at a lot of published studies on herbal medicines in general and their adverse events and, uh, or their or, uh, case studies where there was an issue. And they never characterize the product. So we, we don't even know if it's a really <laughs> the right product that we're talking about or if it actually had the right ingredients that it, it, it claimed it had. Um, also, we, got, we did pick up some of the demographics, as I mentioned, uh, but often not everything. And then we looked at circumstances and time course of exposure. And then finally, specific adverse effects experienced. 
and sufficient symptom characterization to be able to categorize it. Is this real? Is it something we need to pursue further? Um, phase two, what was done here, <clears throat> is essentially a follow-up of phase one incidents. So detailed information was collected regarding the most recent exposure, the history of exposure, um, the details of the adverse symptoms, treatment of the adverse symptoms, if there was any treatment, um, brief but relevant medical and drug history, if they could gather that. Sometimes it, they couldn't. Um, and then if subjects received medical treatments, uh, medical re re records were obtained, Sometimes. Uh, now, all of this seems rather nebulous because you're dealing with consumers. You're not dealing with somebody that's in a hospital. So you get what you can from them, and sometimes they refuse to answer, or sometimes they don't know, or sometimes um, there's just, it's an email chain, and there's just not enough data there. Phase three is where the rubber hits the road, and you actually get a healthcare provider, a physician experienced in adverse drug events um, involved. So they look at temporality. Uh, they look at biological, physiological, pharmacological plausibility, and they look at alternative causes that could have happened. Um, and so that's really how this whole system was set up. And then further in phase three, uh, de-challenge, did the product exposure withdrawal result in amelioration or elimination of the symptoms or reported effects? And then the re-challenge, did a re-challenge occur? And I have to say, when we get to the SAEs, you're gonna be disappointed because a lot of times this wasn't done, but I'll go through them nevertheless. And then after the review, what's the opinion? Was it real? Um, so the seriousness and need for follow-up, this is that last slide, phase three, is done by a board certified physician. Um, and if a case meets the, the serious adverse event, criteria, safety call prepares the appropriate MedWatch form, and then reports that. Now, this is a period of 18 months, and it also give you an idea of Charlotte's web sales, but uh, it's a period of 18 months, and this is what was used to grade the adverse events. And this is a typical, this is not can cannabinoid friendly. This is just what is used in the industry to grade adverse events. So grade one is considered very mild. Uh, you get to grade three, it's more severe. You get to grade five, well, you died. Uh, now the dose range, now what Char Charlotte's Web has determined is that they've got about a 1.4 milligram per kilogram of CBD average daily consumption. Uh, and I'd, I'd love to hear comments from the physicians as we, as we get to the end of this, but um, it's, it's, uh, it, it seems on the low end to me, but uh, maybe, maybe that's just my naivete. Um, serving suggestions vary by product with the highest recommended serving size of about 30 milligrams three times a day. So now you're getting 90 milligrams. Um, and then the results, what we found was there were about 2 million product sales. Now, Product sales is what we had to use to be able to establish any sort of statistics um, or at least numbers. Uh, and I realize there's a huge limitation here. We'll talk about that limitation in a second, but it, pro one product per house was really one person using it or were multiple people using it. So it's just hard to know based on product sales, but that's what we've got, right? You, you just can't know when something's out there. Now there's a history of using product sales with other data such as um, some of the uh, hairsprays and bug sprays and uh, that sort of thing. So, you know, we used what we could. We had to back it up with past experience. And in fact, there was past experience where they used product sales. The number of AEs, not serious AEs, but AEs was 431 during this period. Now, if you if we correlate that, and like I said, we can't really do that, but if, if you were to say roughly 2 million people were using the product, and there were 431 AEs, well, that's about 0.022% AEs per unit sold. Again, it's a weak number, but it is a start. Now, SAE occurrence was about 0.00036% per unit sold. Um, so again, it gives us some data. Um, seven 
serious AEs were categorized in this time. Of the AEs, 98.4% were classified as non-serious. Now, here's a summary of the adverse events. I don't, by any means, stretch the imagination. I don't expect you to be able to read this, but we'll pull it out for you. Um, and so what we see is gastro effects, gastrointestinal effects were the most common. Uh, nausea, about 25 people. Um, general gastrointestinal uh, symptoms, about 16. Abdominal discomfort, about 11 people. In, or products sold. Oh, and diarrhea, about 10. And then if we look at the central nervous system, headache was common, dizziness, common for adverse events, that is. This is really a very small percentage. Uh, but headaches, dizziness, and seizures. And then if we look at um, the central, uh, the uh, uh, psych uh, effects, anxiety in about 23 uh, users and insomnia in about 13 users. And so there's our numbers. If you look at serious adverse events, and we can use per unit sold, we can see about 0 0.36 SAEs per 100,000 units. I'd say that's pretty good. Um, so in terms of the SAEs, there were two GI issues, two neuro, two psych, and one ocular. Um, and you all go through these, and you can, help, uh, you can help me determine if you think they're real, but I, I have an opinion. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. 35-year-old uh, using Charlotte's Web uh, hemp extract, which is about 17 milligrams per mil, for about 45 days for anxiety and depression. Uh, the dose was unclear. She was titrating up to 40 milligrams a day, but we really don't know from there. Um, unspecified pharmaceuticals, so there were pharmaceuticals on board as well. Uh, and then this person developed agitation, chills, night sweats, insomnia, and loss of appetite. And then into a fever, stopped the CBD, went to the Interurgent Care Center, and was advised to go to the ER uh, if his fever didn't resolve. His fever continued for approximately 78 more, seven to eight more days, and he began to experience headaches, nausea, and vomiting with blood. Um, he presented to the ER, blood and urine, no specific diagnosis was made, released home with instructions to follow up with his PCP. Symptoms re resolved within 10 days, um, and that's what we've got. Uh, did he stop the CBD? We don't know. Did he continue? You know, that, that's what we've got. Um, so uh, it sounds like the stomach flu, I mean, <laughs> right? Uh, okay, so SAE2, uh, grade three, 79-year-old female who began using Charlotte's Web. Original formula, that's about 50 milligrams per mil, uh, 25 milligrams per mil, three to four times daily, and then she escalated the dose. We don't know what kind of dose escalation she did, unfortunately. Um, approximately one month after starting the product, increase the dose, and continue dosing three to four times daily for a month. She DC'd using the product because she was no longer experiencing pain. Okay, and then one month later, she resumed taking an unspecified amount of the product to help with sleep. Well, at this point, she developed nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, and reported to the ER where she was treated for dehydration with IV fluids and an anti-nausea medication through her IV line. Um, so the ER doctor thought her symptoms were due to food poisoning and, if she was, and, and she was released the same day. Three days later, she took another unspecified dose of the product to help with sleep and again got sick. Um, she discon discontinued using the product at this time. Now, if this is accurate, it sounds likely that this could have been an actual event. However, there's a lot that we don't know here. Uh, oh, and her back pain returned the following month. So she began using an unspecified dose of CBD and smaller doses. Again, developed nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So now we've got three, uh, two or three re-challenges here. So um, it, it does look like a likely uh, SAE. Now, another SAE, 41-year-old female as, as an aggravation of her pre-existing seizure disorder. Um, the dose was unknown and buried again. ER, ER doctor thought her symptoms were due to food poisoning, and uh, she was released the same day. I think I must have a slide mixed up here. Uh, her past medical history, unspecified brain surgery over 10 years. Yeah, there was a jug juggling of things here. I don't know how this happened. Um, 
She reported that the number of her normal seizures decreased from 30 to 40 per month to about eight per month while using the product over five years. After five years of use, she gets a sudden increase in her seizures. Um, so what, what was that one? Was it, uh, there's just not a lot of information. Um, okay, 80 year old using Charlotte's Web, original formula, again, 50 milligrams per mil, times four years for nerve pain. So she increased her dose, and shortly after she increased her dose, she became lightheaded and confused. Um, her speech was slurred and her eyes wouldn't focus. Now this is four years in. Uh, she presented to the ER, uh, CT scan uh, was negative, doc suggested a TIA, the symptoms subs subsided within 30 minutes and she was released to return home. Approximately two months later, she developed the same symptoms and went to the ER. The symptoms subsided within 30 minutes, CT scan was normal, admitted to the hospital and told she may have had another TIA if she had a TIA in the first place. Uh, she was released the next day with the recommendation of follow up with a PCP. Uh, she followed up with a PCP and a neurologist and the PCP stated there was probably an interaction between her gabapentane and the THC in the hemp product, which probably is unlikely if you really uh, look at the data with gabapentane. Um, she DC'd the CBD and her gabapentin dose was decreased by 50%. Now, this one is interesting as well, and this is a disruptive mood dysregulation, nine-year-old female. Uh, her dose, she was using 17 milligrams at night and seven, seven milligrams during the day. Uh, and what do, we, what do we see here? She gave her daughter, the, the mother gave the daughter the 17 milligram product at night. The following even, evening, no product was used. Okay, so she's, she's got about 24 hours here. Uh, the next morning, now we're at 36 hours roughly. The next morning, the child's mother give the, gives the child the seven milligram product. Within a few hours, the child began to exhibit behavioral changes. She was given another dose of the seven milligram, milligram product in the afternoon. The child then became angry, punched her mother and her mother's boyfriend, and began yelling suicidal statements. Sounds like a good strategy to get attention, right? Um, there's no information on what psychiatric med medications this patient was on, or if these medications were abruptly ceased and replaced with the CBD product. So we really don't know much here. So it's hard to pin this to uh, the, the product itself. Now here's another one, another psych, eight-year-old female using original formula, uh, hemp extract oil for autism spectrum disorder. Uh, dose is 25 milligrams by mouth, once to twice daily. Uh, each time the child received the product, she acted out and cried briefly. Uh, day four, usual dose in the morning and went to school. Uh, the school nurse called to report child was having a seizure, vomiting, drooling, staring into space and with her eyes rolled back in her head intermittently non-responsive, transported to the ER by ambulance, where she was responsive upon arrival. The treating physician agreed that she experienced a seizure. He did not think the product contributed to her symptoms. No treatment was given. She was released after approximately five hours, and she was asymptomatic upon release. Re remained asymptomatic one week later at the time of the report. Um, did she continue? We don't know. Okay, uh, and then the last one, 73-year-old female, dose of 30 milligrams uh, daily hemp oil extract for arthritis pain. Uh, three weeks after starting the product, developed changes in her vision. Movement in her vision out of the lower part of her right eye when nothing was there, flashing lights and steady lights, uh, diagnosed with ischemic optic neuropathy. Uh, they de-seed the product and returned for a follow-up. Uh, she was on steroid eye drops uh, as a uh, treatment. Nine days later, returned to her ophthalmologist for depth perception and visual field test uh, with no significant change. Two months later, had a 20% improvement in her vision. The ophthalmologist and the PCP gave her permission to start using the CP CBD again. And one month after restarting the product, reported that she believed her vision was continuing to improve, but she had not yet had another test to confirm this. Um, I don't know, it doesn't sound very likely. Now, um, previously documented AE. So let's look at the Epidiolex 
uh, study, and here's what we got. We got somnolence at 25% of, of the AEs, not 25% of people, but 25% of the AEs. A decreased appetite, uh, 22, diarrhea, 20%. Elevated transaminases, about 16%. Uh, fatigue, malaise, asthenia, about 12%. Uh, lethargy, lethargy, excuse me, 8%. And convulsions, about 11%. And these doses are about tenfold higher than is typically used by Charlotte's Web uh, consumers. So let's compare these, comparison of AEs. On one side, we've got the post-market surveillance done with these lower dose products, Charlotte's Web's products. On the other end, we've got the epidiolic uh, clinical trials. And you do see a commonality in terms of gastrointestinal. Um, but other than that, the, the fatigue, uh, and malaise, uh, a little bit there, but uh, if, you, if you consider nausea, but really uh, not a lot of correlations. Let's talk about limitations of this data. Uh, multiple reliable methods to collect AEs. So some of the AEs, uh, spontaneous reporting through national pharmacovigilance databases, collecting practice data, soliciting events from healthcare professionals, uh, they all have their weaknesses, direct observation. So they've all got weaknesses, they've all got strengths. So surveying patients obviously has some weaknesses. Uh, but this provides a starting point um, for this sort of work. Uh, and it is suboptimal data collection. It would have been great to have seen more stuff here. Um, so confounding factors we could have had here, uh, underlying medical conditions, obviously. Uh, prescription medications, obviously. Dietary changes. Um, so biological variability, life stressors, are, they're all uh, considerable. Um, and also just correlating units to people is very, very difficult. So I'm getting told I need to get off the stage here. So I am going to jump to my last uh, slide here. And what I'd like to point out is let's, as an industry, Let's support this sort of work. And as an industry, if you're running a company, this is a really good chance for you to actually add to the database. It is considered not as strong as clinical trials, but it is regular data. And FDA and uh, European Medicine Agency use this sort of data to make decisions, it's consumer reported data, to make decisions about, about safety. So I'd really encourage you to um, consider stepping up to the plate and, and doing more of this sort of thing. Especially if we could do this with some of the other cannabinoids, CBG, uh, THCV, it'd be a huge plus to the safety data. That's it. Thank you.